right now you have three different spectrums I'm seeing in terms of how people feel about this mm-hmm. movie. You have people who are like, what the what are critics talking about? I love this movie. Then there are people who go, two thirds of it are good. The finale is kind of a letdown. Mm-hmm. And then you got people, which me fall in the spectrum of, wow, what a disappointment. <laughs> you know? So you got three pretty much different opinions, and those tend to be the three. And uh, I'm on that side. Hello there, Reject Nation. I'm Greg Alba. And I'm John Humphrey. We're going to talk about a little Emmy Night Shyamalan and Lani movie. Yeah. Called Glass. Um, Highly anticipated. So this is actually going to be sort of podcast format. Um, uh, there's a variety of reasons why. I mean, we decided to do a little set in case people decide to watch us for however fucking long we talk today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but because by <laughs> having to be watching, I should do my hair like glass. Let's just, you know, he has curly hair. Yeah, you just got to get that part going on the one side. Uh, I mean, if you guys are actually podcasting this, you can't see what no, I'm I doing. Should, yeah, I should shave my head and be <laughs> both Bruce Willis and yeah. Kevin. Old white guys going at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the true master plan. <laughs> With an evil black guy. <laughs> Brilliant black guy is going to get these two bald white dudes to fight each other in front of everyone. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a spoiler talk. Um, first off, the reason that we're just hopping into spoiler is, man, I'm so distracted by my hair now. It's looking away. It yeah, it's got a mind of its own, man. Um, it's going to be a spoiler talk uh, because after no... the movie was done, I was like, I have no clue how to communicate this. My my, pa- I've never felt so passionate <laughs> about an M Night Shyamalan movie before. Uh-huh. Um, never. Uh, like I, I adore the hell out of Unbreakable. I love yeah, that movie. Great. This movie elicited some other kind of passion <laughs> that <laughs> I just did not <laughs> see coming. I, I didn't, um, and and I figured that uh, the only way to really communicate my thoughts on this would be uh, to just hop into a spoiler. And the reason we're doing podcast format is because I don't really want to. Is this January time? It's not like you make money on January and YouTube with your videos you put out. Yeah. <laughs> Why not try revenue? Something. Might as well just be honest about that. Every YouTuber's thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so they're yeah. just not talking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what almost every YouTuber is thinking about. And um, I'm and, all. And also, Universal is not overly friendly. <laughs> that's honestly the main reason. Is um, literally uh, like for for Halloween, which is a Universal produced. Blumhouse venture, mm-hmm. uh, Universal. They're very, very. I know Angry Joe put out a thing about Lionsgate recently. He taught, he briefly touched on Universal, but Universal, especially if I if we even use just footage with no audio, usually that's the, the trick to kind of get away with things for you guys who are aspiring YouTubers. Well, and you know, <laughs> yeah. if you look at fair use, technically, if you're using visual aids to help with commentary, yeah. that's legal. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. and it's like we're not showing the clips, we're not showing the trailers. Um, yeah. And, but no audio at all, but sometimes just a visual aid gets the video demonetized. So like putting together the Halloween spoiler review where it, it took about 45 minutes to shoot. It took me about two to three hours to edit down. And then, you know, whatever time it took to make the fucking thumbnail. <laughs> and then you make nothing off of it. And, and it's just like, swoop in and go, yeah. nope. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, is there like, oh man, it's, it's demotivating to want to like, cut up a, a video together so and that was you, a positive review too. it was a positive <laughs> like, it, it was a positive recommendation trying to help you guys yeah. make more money come on so if you guys just want to walk around or if you want to clean if you want to do whatever to you just listen like uh that's how i do with a lot of these longer videos is, is i just listen I, I don't really sit down and watch if you want to watch and look at my weird thing i did with my hair just now go for it um but yeah let's talk about glass spoiler talk if you haven't seen it that's been your warning it's gonna be all spoilers from here on out mm-hmm. and uh, i don't really have a guide uh i'm just gonna really go off my feelings here i did write down some notes on my phone for myself last night right. but uh, before going into this i think that there are three there's several ways you can kind of rank this movie uh, that were hitting me about halfway through the movie. One way is to go, as a January movie, huh. it's pretty good. Like, for, for a January movie, 
it's not it's not it's bad. ambitious yeah it's trying to do a lot of things yeah it's it's definitely like one of the better january films and it's a distinct movie that yeah. feels like it was authored by like a filmmaker of a certain caliber yes you know? and it's not uh it's not m night Shyamalan's worst movie <laughs> i'm not True gonna that. say that <laughs> it's not his worst film so that might earn you some brownie points yeah. you know just because sure he was on a high note with the visit being good split being a major success and then this movie having which is so much hype <laughs> yeah having so much hype but it's not his worst film um and then there's the uh the concept of it is the follow-up to both unbreakable and split mm-hmm. in that department <laughs> i find it exceptionally disappointing because okay i i think that there are people who really are going to be strong defenders of this movie. Mm -hmm. And as much as I love going on Screen Junkies movie fights, I truthfully hate arguing with people in real life. (laughs) Like, I know how to respectfully disagree with someone. I do. I know how to disagree with an individual. The internet doesn't, usually. Screw you, you're an asshole. I hate you, die. Kill yourself. Here's why this movie's great, you know. Yeah. So, but but you real, have no talent. Yeah, I don't I don't yeah. know anyone like that in real life who'll disagree with me that way. Yeah. But I don't um I don't disagree with people like in a hateful way. So I'm not gonna because I know we have some disagreements on some areas with this movie. Seems like generally there's some areas that we see eye to eye on. I feel like we ultimately feel similarly in the I'm, I'm just a little more passionate movie. about my I think our, our emotions are, are very yeah. different, but a lot of our points will probably align. Yeah. Well, I saw that it had a 40% on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, now it's like 35, like from the critics, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't really let that affect me because <laughs> I was like, I, there's been Shyamalan movies you and I have both seen that got terrible reviews. Mm-hmm. And then we watch it, and then we both are like, I actually enjoyed yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's yeah. Shyamalan movies that people just hate with a passion. <laughs> yeah, well, then I'm like, I don't like it, but I don't hate it. I'm not like, oh, I'm not this mad movie. about it. Yeah. yeah, well, and also looking over a lot of the early Capsule reviews anyway, it seemed like even like positive, negative, it seemed like it was divisive and like everybody was kind of picking apart different elements. And that, to me, going in was still kind of exciting because I was like... <laughs> I may not get yeah. something guaranteed to be great, but I'm getting something that's guaranteed to at least be kind of fascinating or interesting or something. See, I, I gotta I gotta say, like, th- even after watching it, I am excited to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, not because I'm here and I'm going, I can't wait to rip this movie a new one, which I feel like I'm probably going to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I, I'm excited because this is evidently a divisive film. Mm-hmm. It's not like this film sits at a solid 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. When the movie was done... We, I took strong note of a giant packed IMAX experience that zero people clapped. No applause. Not even a single. <laughs> you know. Nobody tried to start the, the applause. Nobody wave. tried getting that <laughs> clap going. And there was that moment, I think, where I could sense we were all wondering. Yeah. But no. And no one clapped. And so I was like, oh, maybe I'm not alone on this. Maybe. maybe Maybe this is because I thought, okay, maybe critics hate it, but this will be a crowd pleaser, you know? And <laughs> I haven't heard any actual reviews. What I did yeah. was I kind of I went through the capsules and and then I saw like on Screen Junkies News, for example, I started the review of Glass and I just heard Dan and Roth like it. And I stopped it. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't actually finish it. Uh, and I did that with a lot of people online. Yeah. Because yeah, I just yeah. want to know, do they like it? <laughs> but I'll leave it at that. I don't want to hear any details. Yeah. I feel like that's the best time for like a thumb up, thumb down star ratings <laughs> yeah, before yeah. the movie and then after the movie, yeah. the review. And yeah. since watching it, I have I still haven't heard anyone's reviews. So I don't want anyone to like uh influence my opinion. Maybe I'll listen yeah. to some people's reviews and be like, oh, wait a minute, good point. Uh yeah, I didn't see it that way. The thing is, I don't feel like that's going to happen. There are, <laughs> there are certain movies that I just really don't like, and then I look back on it, and then I go, you know what, though? I really dug that film, <laughs> actually. Or It's like Dark Knight Rises, for example, was that kind of movie, where it it didn't give me what I expected. Um, and it's got some evident d- d- flaws or difficulties or something yeah, about it. It's not quite nailing it the way the Dark Knight did, for example. Yeah, Then I, but then when, when I watched it again or looking back on just looking back on it, mm-hmm. I started to really appreciate it. 
Yeah, I, I really like that movie despite some of the flaws, and and thus I'm not like let down yeah. by it. You know, Glass kind of just upsets me more when I think <laughs> about it. <laughs> the more I talk about it, mm -hmm. the more I break it down, the more the more annoyed I get with this movie. Mm -hmm. You see, because I think from a standalone movie perspective, I don't even think in that department it's all that good of a movie. I, I think technically speaking, it's its pace is weird. Uh, <laughs> its structure is poorly done. I think it's dialogue. I think the characters become so much plot devices. I, I, I think that the... Um, some of the performances are like I actually know the performances are good. I, I, the performances yeah. are good. There are times when I think sh the director M Night Shyamalan makes choices that doesn't help the performances in the long yes. run when the, he doesn't limit himself. Like I think that's a big issue. Shyamalan has this uh, obsession with the theme of belief. Yes. If you look at all like <laughs> Unbreakable, first Unbreakable is David Dunn's story of him having to go through. Um, you know, having to believe in himself. Mm -hmm. so having to can, lift those weights in the backyard. Having to lift those weights. You know, it's like <laughs> the power of the mind, belief. Yeah. Split, similar thing mm -hmm. of what if you can, What if, like, sure, it deals with the psychological aspect of DID, but then it's also about what if you believed it so much it could change your body chemistry and you could yeah. become, the, and then you look at his other movies, After Earth, yeah. Signs, yeah. with the whole arc with Mel Gibson's character in Signs, all about faith. I, I don't really remember the village. I don't know if I feel like there's something we believe. I, I, well, I don't remember Lady in the Water. I know there's something about belief in there, but he oh, deals yeah. a lot in this theme of belief. I mean, the village is all about a major deception, you know, yes. and, the, and the belief that comes out of that. And and the and also uh, as we go into this, I was thinking about it. I'm like, a part of what makes his his twist, the good twist of Shyamalan, <laughs> effective is your belief in what's being portrayed on screen first. Mm -hmm. For example, Sixth Sense, yeah. um, you believe you're just watching a guy who's playing child psychiatrist to a kid who sees dead people. Mm -hmm. You believe that, so when the twist comes, it's whoa, you it's know, right there the whole time. Glass, and uh, remind me to bring this point back up again later. This and I thought about it. I was like, not glass, uh, unbreakable. Mm -hmm. Unbreakable. This is why I had such issue with Sarah Paulson's character and her twist reveal in this movie. Because if you look at how the movie Unbreakable handled it, yeah, that's how I thought they should have done it. Where Glass is really the bad guy of Unbreakable, uh -huh. right? He's really the baddie. In but a, in a very interesting way. Yes. Yeah. But that's not revealed till the very end in its twist moment. Similar to what they do with Sarah Paulson here. The thing is, I I, I had a moment or two in, in Unbreakable when I first saw it. Like, he kind of seems like a suspicious guy. Okay. But over the course of the film, till its final reveal, you get to a point of believing that he is really the support and aid to help David Dunn become yeah. who he needs to be. Their friendship is tangible. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And that, that so makes the everything twist, more potent. So when that twist comes, it's, whoa, what the fuck? No. This guy's horrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Like, that's what makes it so effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I don't want to go up too much in that time, but I'm going to bring up some of those key points later. Uh... This movie, I thought, uh, just on a standalone level, had just so many plot holes, illogical character choices. It seemed like it it thought it was this very nuanced commentary when I was... It, it didn't feel lived in to me. Where, yeah. Whereas Split and Unbreakable feel like its themes and commentary are lived in through its portrayal of the characters. Because as a standalone movie, I don't really like it. As an unbreakable and split follow up, I hate it. That's the difference. Is well, see, there's two different feelings there. Yeah, and then <laughs> the, the neat thing for me is I feel like whenever we do these reviews, I, I, typically you're very good at reviewing the the previous stuff and coming in, and usually I like to do the yang to that and kind of come in with fresh eyes. It's been a while since I've seen Split and Unbreakable, so to me this was more of a standalone experience. And yeah, as a standalone experience coming from that perspective, it, it still has so many ways in which it doesn't hold up and it doesn't quite stick so many of the landings it's trying for. And one of the big things I've realized more and more as I've thought about it is that is the biggest missing element is this movie doesn't feel like it has a protagonist. It just has a bunch of characters in one place that we kind of look at from time to time while people talk about them. 
and they talk about yeah. each other. And nobody, re- like, there are a couple POV shots, but you never really feel like you get inside the head of David Dunn or Elijah Price or Kevin Crumb in this movie. They're just these kind of objects on screen. Even Sarah Paulson, if she's the protagonist, isn't even really a protagonist. Everybody checks out for a long time. The person on screen, the most, is James McAvoy just oscillating through personalities, you know, over yeah. and over oh, again. Oh, man, do I have some issues with how that was handled. Rain we're, it we're in, gonna man. we're gonna go all over the place on this yeah. one. I know it because like there, I, I I thought this movie was so problematic. Yeah, but, the, but you, have a, the, you have a good. That's a, that's the, pretty much the the uh, the core of the issue with the movie is it doesn't know its point of view. It doesn't know its perspective. It misses an opportunity to give you an emotional avatar to invest in or somebody yes. to be on this journey with. So now we're just kind of peering into a lab, you know. <laughs> yeah, of the lab of M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. It feels like M. Night Shyamalan made a fan fiction follow-up yeah. to his own movie. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. It's because it's, <laughs> it's, it is unruly in the way that a fan fiction can be. It's like, oh, but 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 then this happened. I want to <laughs> yeah, yeah, write yeah, about yeah. this. You know, like I feel the outline, and I like a lot of the ideas. I do. And there are are there sequences that are cool. Yeah, there are some cool. Se- like I love that shot when Elijah's wheeling. Uh, and then, oh, they're and in the then basement. Kevin's, Kevin's like, yeah, fucking up all those, those guards behind him. Great shot. And there a is- great moment because you see the emotion in Elijah's face and the action yeah. behind him, and it creates something that's actually nuanced. In Some that of second. Sam yeah. Jackson's lines are <laughs> awful, <laughs> awfully written, but his performance saves so much of that of those lines Mm -hmm. like he is amazing he's the best part of this whole movie he does when he finally comes into the plot he he does a lot for this he elevates the shit out of this movie like there there were times i was sold i might start liking this movie because of him but it, it never really got me to that department it never swung me that direction yeah i mean the the whole movie for me was a back and forth between like Okay, this is cool. I'm getting engaged. Maybe it's taken off. Uh, now they're losing me again. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no, no! It could be taken off now. No, I see it. I see it. Yeah. No, no, they're losing me again. Yeah, yeah I, like if, if I already just review it as a standalone, I, I do think that it's poorly written, to, especially its dialogue. Like Shyamalan's not exactly known to be subtle. Uh, <laughs> he tends to be a little preachy, but yeah. especially here, it's so ham-fisted. Like I said. It not lived in, which as a follow up film, very disappointing because those those predecessors are very much lived in movies that mm-hmm. get these points across and have perspectives. It's like Unbreakable is about David Dunn being thrown into the perspective, of the world of glass, mm-hmm. and Split is the perspective of of Kevin, mm-hmm. and then in this movie, it's like okay, it's it starts off with. This weird fast pacing, like I'll tell you, I was never bored. I, were you bored? I was never. I was never actually bored during this movie. There were times where I was sitting there going, "Okay, let's pick it up," or or I would say to myself, "This scene, I would have chosen a slightly different tone because the way this movie is progressing, it feels like it's starting to plod because it thinks it's doing something a lot more important than it's actually doing." It's not. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there are times when I was a little bit like, "Okay." <laughs> like let's yeah, make yeah, a new yeah. choice but but i was never just like disengaged you know like even yeah. when i was out of it i was still thinking about it you know fair yeah like, that's fair i don't know how to describe what that feeling is but i think from the very beginning i started to see its flaws as a follow-up um because i think this movie does a lot that kind of abuses no we're getting to the twist and everything but <laughs> i think it does a lot that abuses the uh a lot of moments that were very earned yeah. in the first Oh, and then the predecessors. Oh, yeah. This this movie has a major problem earning its moments across the board. Yeah, and then the re- previous ones earned them really well for the most part. And then repeating moments from the predecessors and just throwing it in here because now it's just a thing that happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah no. I really like, felt like he got high on, on the success of Split and rushed into this. He rushed this. it. Yeah. He, he rushed this one. Like, and, and you know, the, you, you brought that up about how his original cut was like three and a half hours. And, and it, it shows. And it feels it like sh- the combination of you should should have spent yeah. more time on your script to really make this yeah. as good as you think it is. And also, uh, let's smooth this out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, when it starts off already with, um, you know, James McAvoy's Kevin... Uh, Kevin forget, Crumb. Kevin, Kevin Crumb. Kevin Wendell Crumb. And he has the girls. It was like, okay, there's no real build up to this. There's no real tension. It's just what he's doing. Maybe I can just get on board with this. But it's moving kind of just so fast. It's catching up with David Dunn and Kevin Crumb was moving so fast. Where if you look at Unbreakable and Split, they do such a good job at build up 
and tension and reeling you in. Where this movie seems to have a lot of these sound designs and music cues of a horror movie, but I don't feel any suspense or tension because it's just happening so quickly that I'm like, okay, you know, all right, oh, there's the thing where Kevin uh, kidnaps girls. Uh, where that moment in Split yeah. where he first does it is effective. That introduction is powerful. It's, it's, it's scary. And then here it's like, oh, instead of three, now he's got four. He's doing his thing. Yeah, We're catching up. Like Hedwig's Kevin's back to his old tricks. Hedwig's not into to Kanye. Now he's into Drake. <laughs> That's yeah. funny, right? Remember that? And, yeah. and like, I was excited when I saw, um, um, you know, uh, David Dunn's kid was in here. I'm like, oh, that's cool. He brought it back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that catch up, um, I was sort of appreciating. There were times when it felt a little silly and other times where I thought it felt really nice. But I, I like yeah. the general gist that they're working together yeah. and he's his guy in the chair and stuff like that. I thought that was really sweet, actually. Like, I'm all for um, defying expectations. I'm all for that. Uh, I just... I think that expectations, though, were especially laid out by M. Night Shyamalan yeah. himself. He's tweeting about it constantly. That's the... I just finished the second draft, <laughs> you guys! You're gonna love it! <laughs> that's, that's the... That's, like, the issue I have with what we expected. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not even gonna go to the marketing of how this film made it look like it's David Dunn versus Kevin the show, you know? <laughs> like, I'm not even gonna go to that. I'm gonna talk about strictly M. Night's expectation. Mm -hmm. Um... He do, everyone wanted a, a follow up to the David Dunn movie Unbreakable. That's yeah. David Dunn's movie. That's yeah. not Glass's movie, right? Like I love the idea of you got the David Dunn movie, the uh, the the Kevin Crumb movie, and then you have the Glass movie. Yeah. Like I thought that's cool. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. you center it. Right, great like, idea. Concept's cool. And then it, and it's fitting for the mastermind to be the centerpiece right? of the ending chapter. David you know? Dunn is barely a thing in this movie <laughs> and you know what's funny about that is for as much as this movie goes into comic book lore and, and meta stuff i'm like oh so in a in a roundabout way without winking at the camera and acknowledging it you've kind of shown us that it's it's the hero is kind of the least interesting character i guess because this movie just forgets about him for it does most of the time for a movie that fucking keeps the most you see that's what i mean it's like because of its lack of perspective and point of view and proper uh, just proper mood building in this film, whenever yeah. they, in Unbreakable, when they go into comic stuff, when when Glass starts talking about this comic book shit in that movie, it's like, this is kind of cheesy. Mm -hmm. But David Dunn's reaction to that was like, what the fuck, this guy's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. But yeah, then yeah. as it's building and its mood's going, you believe the fantasy, you believe the poetry, you believe yeah. it. And, and, and then David he, being averse to it at first helps us because yeah. that's our reaction. And know? then in here, you know what a big issue I have on just a technical scale? There's a, there's a very poetic superhero kind of romanticizing version with, uh, with, the, with, with Unbreakable. Mm -hmm. And there's a very specific tone and mood. And as, and then Split has this uh, this uh, thriller that ha that explores the psychological aspect. So Unbreakable is this commentary on superheroes, and then uh, Split is the this like yeah sure on DID, but also it's a, it's a psychological exploration. When it and, plays up the horror of the villainy of a supervillain, yeah. you know. And then in this movie, instead of finding his own unique tone. <laughs> He just kind of tries meshing it, and it doesn't work. It does it, it. So then, when when Glass starts spouting off like comic book shit, yeah. you're like, "This feels kind of dumb. It doesn't feel lived in. It feels it feels M Night Shyamalan giving Sam Hill Jackson words to say now." Well, yeah, I mean, a big <laughs> issue I had with the comic book aspects of this movie overall. It's like I don't mind that Elijah's doing it. I, I kind of had an issue that everybody started to do everybody. it over time. Every it's fucking dumb. <laughs> yeah, and that like, I was like, wait. But but more like, than that, it, it was that uh, so much of that I could just feel like, yeah, there's Sam Jackson and he's technically delivering the words, but I just feel like M. Night Shyamalan is now talking to me, whereas that felt like dialogue <laughs> yeah, before. Yeah. There's so much in this yeah. movie that feels like it's just M. Night and I feel like a few more passes on the script could have helped the characters feel more like characters yeah. instead. You no, know? It's, it's lack of being uh, lived in. Like, I'm going to keep, yeah. I'm probably going to keep saying that a lot because that's the core issue with this film. Is it's not lived in anymore. No. And back to the expectations, right? Mm -hmm. Split comes out. We have no idea that this is in the same, whatever, un un glass universe, right? Mm. Split comes out. And then what does he do? He throws David Dunn at the end of the movie. Not Glass, David Dunn. And then what starts happening when he starts talking about this? 
Yeah, Kevin was originally of the villain in Unbreakable, but I couldn't fit him in, so instead I made his own standalone movie. That way they could go up against each other. So you know what? That expectation of wanting to see them go up against each other wasn't the audience's fault. <laughs> yeah. That is M. Night Shyamalan's fault for wanting that and him not properly delivering that. Like, do do some weird things that we didn't see, that we didn't expect. Do some things that are unique. You know, fucking build this. I don't care. Do that. But you gotta, I really felt like as an audience member, that was so unbelievably lackluster. Mm-hmm. Like, they start yeah. fighting in the first, like, five minutes of this movie, right? Like, like, not five minutes, like, the first act. They start yeah. fighting each other. Like, literally, when their break into act two is at the end of their fight. Yeah. And then they have the final fight. And by, by that point, I kind of forgot David Dunn's in this movie. Yeah. He he takes such a back seat. And I'm like, what's the hype with the unbreakable final follow, finally following up if you're not even going to... What's with all the commentary on on the superhero genre when you seem to not give a shit about your one actual hero? <laughs> you yeah, know? see, that's the problem about this movie is the more I think about every aspect of it, the more I'm like, I get what could have worked and I see how it just was a total mess in execution because in a sense, I'm like, okay, it kind of seems like David Dunn is act one, Kevin is act two, Glass is act three. But even still, that structure fails itself because you have an ensemble that never gets a chance to truly be an ensemble and to develop. It's like they hint at these things. Kevin and and, uh, and David Dunn are like across the hall from each other. And they hint at these ideas. They all know about each other. They all have opinions about each other. And they could have done interesting stuff about that. And they just never really touch it at all. So by the time that they actually fight... It is underwhelming because you're like, oh, A, the fight isn't that cool. And B, you're like, why? Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Kind of. Why? <laughs> you know, like. It, it, it really upset me. Yeah. It really upset me. And, you know, like we're going to hop around. I'm going to go and I had an actual thought in my head where I went, fuck you to like the movie. <laughs> and I've never had that with any M. Night Shyamalan movie. Rarely do I have that with a movie. Mm-hmm. But when they get shot. And when they get killed, when they die, yeah, I'm all for them dying in this movie. Like the concept of, oh, cool, yeah, wrapped up that trilogy. But the way they die, <laughs> that where it has nothing to do with the conflict between them, that build up between, oh, Kevin and David are going to go up against each other. And they die in such this like emotionless way to have some twist reveal about shamrock gang you know yeah yeah, the 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 humanity in order to preserve ourselves has to either convince these people that they're crazy or eliminate them entirely which again is a good idea to play with in this scenario it's a new kind of take on some x-men shit (laughs) yeah at the same time again just the movie doesn't really earn it and it and it starts to feel random the way everything comes out well it's because he piles three twists on top of each other <laughs> like well, yeah, it's and, twist after twist after twist, and, and literally the last like third like thirty minutes of this movie, it's just a bunch of twists. And I'm really starting to wonder if all the stuff that came out of that original cut was probably character moments, probably a lot of David Dunn Definitely. stuff. And I'm wondering if maybe that's why Bruce Willis isn't really behind this movie because maybe a lot of his scenes got cut or something. It um, feels that way because David Dunn's arc, it like I. I really did not. What is his arc? I, I, he begins to believe again because oh, Shyamalan okay. retreads that same belief territory. That's why I started talking about this because it's like, dude, you, you, I, I'm all, I think you could do, I'm all for him doing like five more movies where the theme is belief. Mm-hmm. It's just if it's not lived in through the characters or not proper character story, I don't care for it. Because I'm like, he just went through the same arc he had in freaking Unbreakable, but we just did it in 10 minutes as opposed to two hours, yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, when, when Sarah Paulson is interviewing them, I, I'm, I'm actually for the idea. I'm for that uh, idea of a psychiatrist or psychologist who's like, ah, these people are kind of, cr- these people are crazy. They have these delusions. And I know that the ultimate reveal is that's, that's, that's not what she ultimately believes. Yeah. But for that twist to have an emotional weight, I can't be sitting there in the audience going, what, is this woman dumb? <laughs> like, yeah. she's stupid? Like, why, why, are, why are there so many things being brought up? Like, all that dumb justification. Those, those bullets in that shotgun were old. Like, 
I don't give a fuck. And then he was shot like right up in front of him. He was like a foot away when he was shot. Or how about bring up how David Dunn's medical history, he's never been sick. How about he had no scratch on him? What, he just bumped his head on the... Like, have a real debate. where Because in that moment, for that to be effective, I have to be as an audience member going, are they actually crazy? I, like, I have to question it. Maybe they're not. Maybe I ultimately don't believe it. But I personally am like... We are spending so much time on this debate so we can do some psychological element with these characters where ultimately, as an audience, I'm like, I saw two movies with these guys. I know that they're not crazy. And the fact that they're not addressing so many other things that they could be addressing, if they're not having an actual debate, it's just her making like weird just like him being able to climb on walls. You know, people who rock climb, I'm like, what the fuck? No one rock. Like, this is, it, it was just dumb to me. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I get it. I, I like the concept of that quite a bit. And actually, I think that's one of the things the movie does sometimes succeed at. For me personally, there were times where I was sitting there going, oh, I didn't expect this, and I am intrigued by it. I don't. I, I had that reaction. I was like, I don't expect them to just be normal and you know out of their minds, but I like that we're going there, and I like some of the ways they're trying to explore that, and I liked what the actors each did with that as they're each becoming convinced except for obviously sam jackson is kind of never convinced of that um but yeah i i mean ultimately it's not smart enough to truly drive home all of the things that we've seen because yeah when he's crawling on the ceiling i mean you know that's a <laughs> bit hard to explain away um and i'm forgiving of stuff like that i was forgiving at the time even but ye, ultimately it's one of those things that there are other movies that don't do that same thing, but like there are certain movies where the twist is like, oh, it's all in the main character's head and they're a split personality, where that's like a cheap gimmick because they don't really bother to walk around inside of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are certain other movies that really earn that twist we've seen a thousand times by walking around in it and making it feel like you've said multiple times, lived in by earning it. And I feel like in that department for this movie, it only gets about halfway. They had me wondering. You mean the glass is half full, John? Uh -huh. Ah, there you go. Like everyone who says on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> I, 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 I love a good pun, but I do not love movie That is uh, like movie abused, man. Puns. Glasses. Apple. Every horror movie <laughs> scares up money at the box office. I'm like, guys, I bet you're clever. I just thought there was so much time dedicated to it, and I never, it, the movie never had me going. And I didn't think, like, for David to question himself... I, d I couldn't get into it. Well, yeah, because we got to see them be having a personal moment about that. Like, we got to see them struggling with it and really unpacking ex exactly. it. Exactly. And we don't. Like, that debate is so poorly written, I thought. Like, the, mm -hmm. the actual scene teasing the big trailers of where they're all three sitting around Sarah Paulson. Mm -hmm. Like, if David was bringing up, hey, I've never been sick. Do you see that once in my medical history? I've never been hurt. I do this. I do this. And if she's, like, able to logically say shit that could actually explain that away then i would have then i would have had me going a little bit but the thing with sarah paulson's character is that from the very second she showed up i was like nah she she's probably not a good person because of the fact that they're all fucking waiting outside of kevin's factory mm -hmm. like ready yeah. <laughs> all of them and it just had me going i just kept i kept going back to that moment as i was watching the film Going, wait a minute, what, why, well, before the reveal that they're shamrock people and that she's just not with the cops, uh, I was like, were, were they all just waiting there? When, like, why, why weren't they all trying to get the four girls who were kidnapped? They're talking about, um, uh, she was saying David would have, uh, you know, been arrested and, and blamed for that girl's injuries. And I'm like, well, why the fuck were you guys just chilling outside? How'd you know to be exactly there that they would fucking fall out of the damn window and land right there? Oh, I just took that as they, of course, they keep tabs on them. When they do the whole reveal of their shadowy organization, no, I'm but, like, yeah, they must know who they are and where to find no, them. No, that's my point, though, is before that reveal has happened, mm -hmm. the reveal is not effective to me because of the fact that I was already questioning so much of 
the plot holes. Like you, the, well, the girls they, run out though, and they're causing such a ruckus, and that's a kind of a long fight. So by the time they get outside, I was sort of like, oh, well, maybe one of them found a phone or something, and they called somebody, or they found a person, and and someone showed up, <laughs> or maybe somebody heard the commotion. Like it's not a nice part of oh, town that for, they're in. For me, that's a stretch, honestly. Like I can, re- I that's that's cool that you got there with that. Uh, for me, I, I just took it as they were just they were literally just chilling outside waiting for them to come out. Yeah. Like both of them to come out. Because, like I said, I'm going back to the idea of what makes his twist effective is that you believe it. Mm-hmm. You you believe the journey, and then the oh shit, that's not what I thought. Mm. Whereas this whole movie had me going, I don't like the debates that Sarah Paulson's bringing up. Uh, I like the idea on paper, <laughs> but this, this movie across the board is I like the idea, I don't like the execution. <laughs> yes, that's it. Like, yeah, because <laughs> the entire execution of Sarah Paulson's character was like damn she's really giving her all Sarah Paulson but I don't I don't I don't believe for one second because I keep poking I keep as an audience member keep poking holes in everything she's saying because characters aren't bringing up stuff and she has weird justifications for how they were able to survive certain things certain elements you know what I mean and then from the for some for some reason that moment to me when they first showed up the shamrock people before the reveal that they were shamrock people that that the audience is supposed to go the audience as a viewer is supposed to go those are police and she's the doctor with them because they're tra- they're here to save those girls just I was no nah, I don't uh, like uh, why were why were they just chilling out there then it seemed like they were literally waiting for them specific I don't know I just did wasn't it wasn't for me that moment <laughs> which had me just that one moment just had me question her the entire time. And I feel like for Shyamalan to have a big reveal like that, because you feel like he really designed his movie to have that reveal, mm-hmm. as opposed to giving us the movie we just kind of wanted. <laughs> we- I mean, I feel like that could have been an aspect of the movie we wanted. It just, it prioritized that instead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it had its priorities all in the wrong places. <laughs> uh, and, and for me, too, I, I personally hate the, uh, the ending of the three characters, the three supports who, for some reason, like, <laughs> I have an issue with the way the characters are written here. Glass's mom, I, I get that she has always been really supportive, and we see it in Unbreakable, that she's had to take care of her child who's always been mistreated and was born a certain way. I could have used a little, a little, just a tiny hint of some inner conflict that your son is also a mass terrorist, you know, like that your son murdered like over a thousand fucking people. Like, where's that little nugget, (laughs) you know, to make this a little bit compelling? Um, Anya Taylor Joy, I I respected. She's wedged into this movie. She's wedged in it, and I hate what they did with her character from a psychological perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I, like, at the end of Split, she's trying to fucking kill him. Shoot him. Rightfully so, because the guy is insane. He abducted her, and he murdered, he ate two of her friends. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I, and her arc of going, I'm gonna, I was okay with introducing that she put her uncle away, and then principal keeps specifying foster family. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, all right, cool. I'm glad you're there. But the fact that she becomes insanely sympathetic for for Kevin Crumb in this movie and they keep ham fisting home we were both abused and that's why well I'm like one part of me made me go well I'm sure your uncle who assaulted you raped you all, all these years was probably abused too why you have no sympathy for him but you have sympathy for dude who abducts several little girls and kills them. And yeah, yeah that's, like, that's sort of a grossly unearned piece of this movie that no. comes off ugly. And there's a kernel of something inside of it that I want to feel like is kind of benevolent. And it, it just, that's one of the most like, Poorly handled in a way that's kind of offensive things yes. about this movie. Yes. I'm like, I'm all for the idea that, you know, okay, this guy's got a bunch of different personalities and the true person that this guy is is just scared and fucked up and alone. And maybe she can see that amid the spectrum. But the fact that, yeah, just like the history of Split just completely goes out the window. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would have liked that if it was like some kind of conflict for her where it's like, well, clearly I can neutralize this guy and that's an important thing to have happen. I, this is weird and scary, but it, also I realize what I'm doing. But yeah, at the end, it sort of seems like do these are they just like 
this now? It's, are they just like, yeah, so yeah. They, do they love each other? Well, like, like the, 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 he, she calms the beast down. Like, what? Like, in and, and of itself, I get that thing because of the whole, like, you're pure and, and you're not trying, clearly you're not trying to hurt Kevin, like, and, and we all exist for Kevin. Like, that little nugget, I'm like, okay, but fucking everything around it is is, is No, I mean, I, I hate the idea of it. <laughs> in some ways, to me, it kind of, I think Shyamalan, what he's going for is that our traumas can actually make us th more powerful. I think that's what he's going for. Um, yeah, your trauma doesn't make you a mistake or or a broken thing necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make extraordinary things out of trauma if you know how to do that. But I I felt that it read a little offensive and a little horrified on abuse <laughs> in some ways. Yeah, uh, again, yeah. It, it, like this, I feel like of all the movies, this one needed the most tender, loving care from an intellectual and an empathetic standpoint because. Not only is that stuff just in, in essential to making the choices okay, yeah, but it, it's they're also essential to making it an engaging, gripping, moving movie. And also, you know? you know, like going back to just as a standalone movie of how stupid things happen, there seems like to be literally no security guards in this place. That happens the, a lot lately too the, in movies. And I'm like, yeah, like the I, the guards in this movie are are the caretakers are are pretty dumb, pretty dumb. They're very dumb, like. And it all falls hand in hand with um, abusing things from the past. Like, I think that moment where James McAvoy is doing the most stereotypical <laughs> of, like, you see, in Split, this is what I'm talking about, abusing things that came from the past. Not not like this is a, an abusive movie uh, in that area. I'm talking about just not feeling the moment of what made the things in the past movie work. In Split... Whenever James McAvoy hopped between characters, he felt like he was a different person. Mm -hmm. And in this movie, some people are loving his performance, and I'm I'm glad you do. I personally w thought it was very cartoonish. I thought when they have that moment where I think gay guy who is att attending to him. Barry. I, oh, 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 yeah, the, the orderly. The guy. orderly yeah. who just keeps flashing. And like, what are you doing first off, dude? <laughs> Why are you just... That's what, another... Whatever you do ain't gonna make a difference. Stop flashing. Well, and... that that again, that's that's another poorly handled moment where I was like, okay, I get it. You're horrified, but like engrossed because you've probably never seen something quite like this before. And it 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 the way it blocks that scene is is pretty dumb. It's dumb, and it's like James McAvoy is now just doing Im <laughs> like those stereotypical caricatures. Well, we used we used and to... it's not they're not characters anymore that he's portraying they're just caricatures well it's yeah it, it reminded me of that game we used to play in improv where you know the you direct, ring the bell, the ring yeah. the bell and you become a new character yeah. and the thing is I, I i think james mcavoy does incredible work in this movie and i think m night Shyamalan, the director didn't help him no. Because I, I feel like I'll, that I'll aspect is a yeah. Shyamalan problem because he needed to know where not to indulge because the thing about the personalities and the oscillations between them is that that works and is so engaging when it is in doses. And this movie indulges hardest on that specific element. So yeah. every time you see Kevin, he's like eight different people and you're like, we get it, it's impressive and it's also hurting this movie because you're not limiting yourself or finessing it into no. the rest of the film. It's like a not Consciously self-indulgent in that department, because in that moment, it it really felt like I was watching like an improv show. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. Felt, like he, it felt like he read that complaint of like, oh, we didn't see enough personalities last yeah. time. Well, let's just fucking. Like, put I don't, them all. I don't like, remember the names of it, but it was literally like him going. Hi, I'm Hank. I'm a cowboy. I'd, hey, senorita, da, 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 I'm Mexican. Now, <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. These these aren't people. These are. These are the most because every single time there's a new character, he would he would do stereotypical accent, introduction of name, what their profession is, or something like that. You know, it, yeah. it, they just weren't people anymore, man. They well, weren't people. Well, and even yeah, in the writing, the way that they some of them seem to keep introducing themselves, it's like it works a time or two if you see a personality that almost never has the light. But half the time, I'm like. You, it's clear that he oscillates a lot and you're all in this facility together. I know it's only a three day window, but like, why, why are you all introducing yourselves all the time <laughs> when you're not seeing very many different people and you're not going to very many different yes. places, you know, like in the, in, huh, and speaking of illogical things, I just, it's so stupid. The way that whole hospital was run when Sarah Paulson's like to tell Anya Taylor joy. No, you can't see him. You're the victim. 
next shot. Okay, I'm gonna put you directly in front of this guy, and well, now, I'm gonna let you hug him and stuff. <laughs> like, now, this is so dumb. <laughs> this is just not, that's what I mean. Like, not one part of this sold me on who she, or the audience is supposed to believe she is. Not one part of me because I'm like, she's she makes dumb calls all the time see that moment weirdly enough that that moment drew me in in an odd way because i thought sarah paulson said the wrong thing and realized it and then and then she took her to see him because it's like you you're the victim it it should be up to you is is like the ultimate point so she says completely the wrong thing she's like no you can't you're the victim and then they go and i'm like oh well maybe there's some kind of deleted moment or something maybe where she's like oh or or she realizes like but, oh why am i telling you what you should be doing you know well you, okay i'll meet you halfway there if the movie doesn't earn it but that's if, the if anya taylor joy was sitting behind the lights not as close right as we are point. in proximity yeah. at this very moment. No, totally. Like, how come none of the orderly can get this close to James McAvoy, but the woman he fucking kidnapped can? <laughs> that makes no sense to me. Well, at first, I thought she wanted to talk to David Dunn. Honestly, in that scene, yep. I was confused. I was like, oh, Kevin, right. <laughs> I didn't, like, the moments that had me going were when Glass and Kevin were teaming up. Like, one, one <coughs> nugget I really appreciated was that Glass always talked to one of the personalities as if they were actual individual people. It was never like, let me play along, or Mm -hmm. I'm judging you, or wow, I'm so fascinated by how you're this person now. He just always talked to each individual like they were some, like they were a different person. Yeah, he tries to kind of find out who each of them is. Yeah, well, like, like you're nine forever, right? When when Hedwig was like, I want to dance, you know, that Mm -hmm. thing? It's like, then dance. I yeah. love that moment. Yeah. I was like, that's a good that's fucking a, moment. That's a character moment. That's a moment. character moment. <laughs> yeah. and it's something this film is woefully short on. Yeah. Character moment. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I love that. Um, it's like, literally, it was, it was like, for a movie called Glass, it's a good thing the best part of this movie is Sam Jackson. Mm-hmm. Simultaneously, it's, it's kind of not really in it for a good chunk of this, like the first half. And I thought the movie could have earned that too. Yeah. You know, but ultimately it's just like, oh good, he's here. It feels like <laughs> Finally. a very edited down movie to meet a runtime. It really felt that way. Like yeah. very edited down. I, w- I actually wouldn't be surprised if they released some three hour cut that I love. I will not be surprised by that. <laughs> yeah. I'd be down for that. Because I'm like, there's a lot here that I just feel like is not explored. I hate that they diminish David Dunn. Mm-hmm. I hate that when he's the hero. And for a movie that preaches yeah. so much about comic book world and lore, you just seem to completely neglect the fucking hero department here. Yeah. <laughs> and then you just kill him off so you can have a twist reveal. <laughs> yeah. and, and then, and also with the Shamrock people. I hate what I guess what I hate about the final moment with the three of them sitting around mm. at the train station. The idea of Sam Jackson releasing the footage to the public is fine by me. Um, I hate that those three are together like they're a fucking family united now because they're all honoring glasses, <laughs> you know, intentions and dreams and vision. If it was, if there was a rewrite on that moment for me of. They're there because they, people need to know about the hero that was David, David Dunn. Dunn. If that was like a, a like talked about motivation, I could have been on board for that. Um, but instead, like for me, I'm like Shamrock people don't seem like bad guys to me. Yeah, I don't agree that kill like killing David Dunn was a fucked up move. But really, they got rid of two terrible people. They got rid of a ma- a serial killer and a mass murderer. Yeah. So two out of the three aren't bad pe- are like bad people who should have been rid of. Mm. Uh, so I thought they're actually doing a good deed. If these fucking people with superpowers primarily come in the form of terrible people, you should probably get rid of them. Uh, and David Dunn was an exception, and that's a heartbreaking thing, but it doesn't earn his death. And so I'm like, I don't really view Shamrock people as the terrible people here, yet this movie kind of glorifies the ambitions of Glass and Kevin as things that need to be shown to the world in this beautiful way. And let's have a victim girl, a mass murderer's mom, and the son of the actual hero all like holding hands together at the train station. Yeah. And it just, it, it felt like uh, your message is getting lost and you're diminishing the characters now yeah. for your point. <laughs> I like the idea that they would all three wind up together somehow because they it would make sense for them to be bonded by all this, but... Yeah, just what they're there for, yeah. as this movie puts it, is just kind of like, 
it, it, to see them all together is kind of sweet, but, but what's going on underneath it is, yeah, just stun, is stunted by the rest of... Yeah, <laughs> there's just too much. The problem is, for me, overall, this movie wants to play in a lot of gray territory, which I appreciate it for wanting to do, but the problem is you got to really be on your A game, you got to be organized, you got to know <laughs> the points you want to make, you got to know what your subtext... you got to really have a good grip on the gray, because if you don't, it becomes this muddy mess of, like, wait... What are the motivations? It seems like these characters are forgetting about whole aspects yeah. of these people. You know, it's like these are all challenging characters in a plot that doesn't really know how to handle how challenging they all can be. And so the nuances are always stunted for the most part because of that. And the things that work are just quiet moments in between for the yeah. most part. I just I, I didn't like that they, it takes this shift where it kind of portrays Glass and, and uh, Kevin as something that is this beautiful thing that needs to be shown to the world now. I get the 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 unity of the three of them, of this like beautiful but twisted just yeah, there there's horrible stuff about it, but these people exist, there are other people like them. The world deserves to, to know about that. Um but yeah, I don't know. The 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 way he... I mean we had a we had a difference of opinion on because I was like it seemed like what he really wanted to get out there was that people like this existed, which ultimately made me feel like David Dunn feels more unnecessary. Like, this is my opinion, that David Dunn feels more necessary because of the fact that when you see all that footage at the end, all you really see of David doing is bending a fucking bar. Mm -hmm. But you see, like, Kevin, like, you know, flipping over cars with people in them and hopping across the grass like a fucking animal, like, doing crazy-ass shit. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, if the point is to show the people, someone with well, powers you see him exist. break down the door and, and things like that inside when he breaks out. Yeah, but I'm like, Kevin could do all that. No, no, David. Yeah, but I'm saying Kevin could do all that. So does David even necessary? But, but you had a thing about... Well, the, for, for Elijah, I feel like it comes back to the comic book thing. Is I don't necessarily think that his master plan is to massacre a bunch of people again i think to get his point across he i think it hurts his point if he only shows the world a horrifying villain he needs the hero side of that to show the yin and yang so that it gets the point across better than just oh fuck monster kill it it's sort of like oh damn like yeah destruction happened but, but that's I, an issue but also there's this super powered guy fighting against the bad super powered guy and that brings the whole picture to oh, me but but see here, here's my problem with that. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm off. I'm actually like way on board for what you're talking about. The thing is, I'm like, well, when I'm looking at the footage though. Oh yeah. I'm like, <laughs> well, what I'm seeing is a guy who's breaking out of a fucking. Uh, he's a patient who's breaking out and is beating up a bunch of cops and then throws them in something and seals them in there. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like it does. Like all this, all the little nuances of of him saying, "I'm doing this to protect you." To the cops, that one time David says it, mm -hmm. like, the, I, is that being picked up on the audio here? Like, who yeah. is? To me, I'm like, this footage actually makes it look like David is a villain. I guess so. Just because he's fighting Kevin, does that? He's also showing he's harming police officers. He's breaking out of places. He looks like a threat. Well, he has a reputation, though. I mean, people know That's who the fair. overseer That's is. That's fair. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And they also probably know who the horde is because there's word around town. Yeah. David's tracking uh, him. That's fair. No, I'll, I'll give you that. I'm just saying the, the footage itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when already the overseer is has a reputation, but he's also portrayed as a vigilante who is doing illegal crimes mm -hmm. and shouldn't be doing. That's what I mean. It's like there's this fucking debate about. Is he a good guy? Like, in the public sphere. Yeah. Which is yeah. which is perhaps the most familiar debate this movie goes for is just vigilantism. Good or bad? <laughs> yeah. um, which we've seen a thousand times before. This is the part of the spoiler review podcast where Greg interrupts it because he's in control of the editing system right now. I was talking with uh, JT from Screen Junkies last night, and he reminded me of a couple of things that... <laughs> really bothered me that he pointed out I'm like oh yeah totally forgot to mention that and I figured I've already come this far with bagging on the film might as well just keep going a little bit further um, when David Dunn dies I'm all for the idea that he dies in this movie like I've said in this review already but the fact that he uh, dies by some dude holding his face down in a little puddle of water and if he was, like, completely underwater, submerged in or something, the tank even, that would be another thing. But no one on the Shamrock team should have superpowers. Right? No one should have super strength or else that goes against the whole Shamrock team idea. So I was like, can't David just 
knock this guy's hand away or push himself up or something. It just it seemed like just a cheap way for him to go out. The, the way this movie sometimes treats him with how water is his weakness just makes me start questioning, like, can, can this guy shower? You know, because the water hits his face, is he just weak? Well, why, why is it treated this way? And, and JT was also telling me about how James McAvoy, uh, not James McAvoy, like Chris Stuckman was saying that James McAvoy could, with the lights that flashed and keep him from leaving the room that he could have like put a pillow on his face or closed his eyes or ran past the lights or something <laughs> to avoid the light. <laughs> like, ah, that's a good point. And the other thing that really annoyed me that I, we didn't touch on this review that uh, JT was reminding me of was that when Joseph Dunn interrupts the fight to heavily explain the plot to reveal about how glass uh, is responsible for the death of Kevin's dad. That moment I thought was so poorly and so corny is just not executed well at all. Like the, the idea that he figures that out is is one thing, but the way he lays it out, because one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of people, especially on the Twitter sphere, say is how. Oh, some people just, they really just want their big superhero action films and they just can't understand a more nuanced story. I'm like, that's not it at all. <laughs> I think it's way overly explained and I completely understand everything that's going on. I just don't, I just think the way it's handled is not up to par with stuff like Unbreakable or Split. Anyway, I come this far. Might as well dig that hole a little deeper. Back to the, the regular film podcast. That's the biggest heartbreaker about this movie is I feel like it has a lot of interesting ideas about superheroes and comic books and and stuff that it would be worthwhile, especially now that that type of entertainment is king. Like, yeah, bring back an unbreakable type thing that deconstructs the, the subject matter while also bringing us a new take on it that's more cinematic, that's more, you know, authored by one specific... The thing is, I do disagree that this movie doesn't have a tone. It's a mess, but it has a very distinct tone to me. It feels like nobody else could have directed this movie but Shyamalan. Like, I, it has his visual and pacing earmarks all over it for as, as inexplicably messy as it is, I feel like that all serves to just strengthen the identity of this movie in a weird way, as a mess, but as a very distinct mess, because I think this movie's gonna stick with me, even if it doesn't in a good way. I'm not gonna forget That's it. Fair. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not gonna forget the choices it tried to make, and I, I feel... I, so many I, things about it because it did so many distinct things where I was like, what the fuck is happening? I felt like it, it didn't find its own unique voice, though, its own unique tone. It really... It didn't ever find clarity, I, no. I, I felt like that its its tone was... It's messy. Because <laughs> I felt like its tone was shifting between wanting to be the split tone or the unbreakable tone, and it never felt like it quite met. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't manage to coalesce them, but, well, uh, maybe for me intermittently, like, there were times when I quite liked the horror angles, or the more unbreakable angles, or, I don't know, just some yeah, of the choices they made. super intermittent for, for me personally. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's super intermittent. Yeah, uh, like yeah. I said earlier on, it, the, the, it was the whole movie I was being pulled in and pulled out, and there are some scenes that I think sing pretty well, and there are other scenes that are just mad flat and needed a different approach or a different tone or some other idea or whatever, but... Well, like I said at the very beginning, there's several ways you can rank this movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and But for me personally, as a fan of um, a huge fan of Unbreakable, a guy who really admires Split, I felt like it really did not s ultimately serve up to that. Mm -hmm. um, as its own movie, it's very, very intermittent. For, like, it's a fine January movie, but it's very intermittent for me. In term, like, as a standalone, like, there's just so many so many questionable plot hole things yeah. to me that are just I, I, and like terribly written dialogue throughout and uh, lack of focus yeah. that I, I just I ultimately makes for a not good movie for me where I, where I think that uh, yeah not like yeah that's my overall feeling I, 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 I was very much let down by this movie yeah I was I was I was like let down and fascinated is, is <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is one of those movies that strikes me that way because I can feel so many things that might have happened and I I like the concept of what this movie is i just don't like the physical of what this movie is yeah. and so it, it ultimately just made me more bummed than angry you oh, know maybe passionately pissed off no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like it didn't make me pissed off i was just like oh no because i was know? like this was our concern that we would talk about off camera <laughs> when we heard about glass it was like i feel like he's kind of rushing into this see i would be angry if it just didn't try 
No, this movie tries way many things way too hard. That's why early on in this talk, I gave it credit for not being boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would be mad if, if Shyamalan checked out and gave us, like, just some yeah. straight bullshit what, where it's clear he didn't really care. What, when I saw the review caps, I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be another slow-moving, boring-ass Shyamalan movie. That's what I was actually yeah. concerned yeah. about. Was, this is going to be, like, fucking just doubling down on that goddamn slow pace shit that he mm. does. And I'm like, oh wow, it's actually the antithesis. This is just so fast paced. Like it, 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 it moves at a like, especially in the first act, it's first rap, act, it yeah. rapidly moves. It starts to slow down at the asylum, but then it explores things that ultimately I didn't find that all that fulfilling. Weirdly, as much as I hate that fucking pun, that glass half full shit, mm-hmm. I gotta like agree with them. Like. Yeah, it feels like a lot of its intent is really met only halfway. Yeah, a lot of the concept. All, all it needed was more poignant character moments, a deeper subtext, you know, a smarter yeah. meta wraparound. Proper development of David Pro- Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <an> actual <laughs> uh, justice done to that particular yeah. character, uh, a, a more finessed way of yeah. introducing the shadowy organization. Like, like, as a fan, I think that's why his death, his death, more than anyone else's, upset me the most. Because I'm like, you, you kind of check out that he's in this movie, then you just sort of kill him off. It should be a, a huge moment. It should be a rewarding, does, yeah. hero- especially for comic book talk the movie. And yeah. should go out in a heroic... <laughs> yeah. I don't know. The, the problem is the way they all... The, the, the physical of how they all each die, I feel like maybe could have worked in a better movie. As it stands, just as a movie goer, I, I would have hoped for a truly great ending moment for David Dunn. As it stands, yeah. though, like this weird, you know, humanity I, and reality and stuff, I get the stark kind of sadness of how it ends. I just don't think it serves this movie overall. No, d- yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it. And uh, and yeah, I mean, I like that Kevin ultimately is the one, he's the one who kills Glass, right? Like ultimately, he Glass oh, yeah. dies because of yeah, he Kevin. flips on him. Yeah, yeah, like I like that moment and I like his breakdown moment. I don't agree that he makes superheroes. <laughs> I'm like. Well, David, oh, wow. I'm like, David was born that way. You just helped him learn that. And, <laughs> and uh, he didn't do anything other than help him you learn just that. Brought him <laughs> yeah. To the yeah. You just found him. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and you just made it so that Kevin you, never got treated. And you and killed like a thousand people and Kevin had to go through this whole thing. And, yeah. and Kevin had to just be abused yeah, while like, his dad never found out how to deal with DID. Really, like, you got like a terrible law of averages happening, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but I like his breakdown moment where like, oh shit, that's evil mastermind glass. Like mm-hmm. I like that moment. Yeah. I, I he's the best part. He is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Well, I got a doctor's appointment that I'm running late to right now. What'd you think of glass? Are you mad that I ranted on it for you know, I I tried uh, exp- all I could do is express my opinion, and that's yeah, how I, know. I felt. Hey, I know there there are people who love this movie, and if you do, uh good for you. I and, I, and I'm said I'm excited to talk about it because I think it's cool that you, you right now you have three different spectrums I'm seeing in terms of how people feel about this mm-hmm. movie. You have people who are like, "What the what are Creeks talking about? I love this movie." Then there are people who go, two thirds of it are good. That finale is kind of a letdown." Mm-hmm. And then you got people which me fall in the spectrum of, "Wow, what a disappointment!" <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you got three pretty much different opinions, and those tend to be the three. And uh, I'm on that side. I think this takes the cake as his most divisive movie. And that's cool. Yeah. Because at least we got an actual film to debate and talk about. Our yeah. new Last Jedi has arrived. I would much rather this than than something just like, ooh. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I would rather this <laughs> than, even though I kind of get the happening a little better now, I would much rather this than a happening or than a lady yeah. in the water or something like that. All right. Well, you guys can subscribe to The Reject Nation. Click that notification bell. And uh, check us out on Patreon. Got a lot of goodies there. We'll talk to you guys soon.